there, their child has been diagnosed with KT. Obviously, everybody, everybody looks on the internet immediately and tends to see the worst case uh, scenarios. And, uh, most uh, do allow one to live a perfectly normal lifestyle and full activities. I don't live in any adult or child uh, with these kinds of problems for any activity. Uh, one of the things that we have learned in, uh, and by the way, in terms of confusion, when you go on the internet, this is why people are confused and apprehensive. This is actually from the NIH website about uh, vascular malformations. And there are helpfully say what is couple trone syndrome and within one paragraph there's about five major mistakes in terminology. They're calling them hemangiomas, which they're not, arterial venous abscesses, which there's no such animal, uh, tumors, which they're not. So you can see that this is the government source of information on these, that uh, there is a lot of confusion. We don't know why it occurs. It's usually congenital but not genetically transmitted. Uh, they all look so similar not so much in terms of the severity, but in terms of where they are and what the features are, that there's got to be something rather than just a random uh, focal mistake in the way blood vessels develop. And people are looking at what goes on uh, sort of the molecular level in terms of how the tissues are different in the areas affected by KT from those that are not. And people have discovered that there are different uh, sort of genetic makeup of the tissues that are involved. And hopefully this will lead to uh, some different therapeutic options over time. One thing in pragmatic terms that we've discovered is we used to think that most of the people with KT had no deep veins, uh, and therefore they were advised to leave everything alone because if you blocked off these abnormal uh, veins that were part of the malformation, they would then have no venous drainage and have swelling that was uncorrectable. It turns out that venograms, which is what we used to consider the gold standard, actually aren't the gold standard, and at least 80% of these people will have normal deep veins that just don't show up on the venogram, but will show up on the ultrasound, which means that we have a lot more, uh, we have a lot more options, and for the options that we have often are similar to the treatments that are now being used for varicose veins, so both venous ablation techniques, which can either use laser energy or radiofrequency energy to basically seal a long segment of abnormal vein from the inside, and uh, prevent some of the back pressure that's being transmitted down the legs. One area that's uh, problematic that we often see in KT is involvement around the knee. And you can see soft tissue swelling and some overlying uh, uh, pigmented areas. But what is the biggest problem, and I think somebody mentioned it earlier, is that you have this involvement of the joint lining or the synovium, which can leak blood into the uh, joint space. Blood is very damaging to the cartilage. Cartilage degenerates, and this is very similar to the process that happens in uh, patients with hemophilia that get premature degenerative arthritis. In the limbs, so we direct a lot of effort at trying to shrink down the malformation around the joint to reduce that bleeding. Skip over that. Uh, in terms of results, uh, we've said for years, and I think the basic numbers haven't changed, that you're not going to cure most vascular malformations, uh, meaning that if you did an X-ray or a scan or an ultrasound or MR before and after, you uh, you would see absolutely no residual left. That's only true in probably less than one out of five patients. On the other hand, uh, the vast majority, and we usually quote about 87%, can be significantly improved either symptomatically or in terms of cosmetics uh, with various uh, interventional techniques. There is always a chance when you intervene you can make things worse, but it's uncommon. And there's also a chance you may just may not do anything that's helpful. So to sum up, I think nobody would deny that these are difficult management problems, proper diagnosis. I think you've heard this morning how important it is to uh, make the correct diagnosis. Surgery, we're using more than we ever used to, but still is best reserved for completely resectable or removable lesions. Uh, high flow lesions we treat with transarterial embolization, but it's important which uh, embolization material you use. Low flow injection, low flow lesions we usually treat by direct injection of one of these sclerosin agents. And anybody can show you a picture before and after that looks phenomenal, but since these are young, healthy people, uh, you want to see how it looks 5, 10, 20 years later, not how it looks an hour later. And uh, these are unusual problems out of the general population, and we continue to feel that you need a group of people of various specialties who have specific interest and experience in these areas. Uh, and it's not that you need to be a rocket scientist to work on these, but you just need to have seen it before. Most of the patients we see for the first time in the office are shocked that whatever they or their child has, that we've seen something like that before, we've seen five that morning. So again, it's just how frequently you see it that you have a better idea of how to uh, manage.